Just going out there. It's Thursday, March 31st. I'm Frank Gerzio. It's the Wall Street Unplugged Podcast, where I break down the headlines and... Uh, tell you what's really moving these markets. So guys, we've seen a lot of news taking place in the crypto industry. This includes Biden's executive order. So that's the Goldman Sachs. This is over the past couple of weeks. Goldman Sachs getting more into crypto. Ray Dalio looking to invest in a crypto fund. And Bridgewater, largest hedge fund in the world, $150 billion in assets under management. Katie Hahn raising $1.5 billion for a crypto fund. She worked at Anderson Horowitz for a long time, but she left the largest venture capital firm amicably to start her new fund, which, of course, Anderson Horowitz does have an investment in. Massive, massive, massive buying of Bitcoin by the operators of stablecoins, which is used to back their stablecoin. Amazing how they didn't do that before Biden's executive, but doing it now. But all this news, which has helped push Bitcoin through 47,000 again, remember, we were like 36,000 not too long ago, a couple weeks ago, it has to do with the regulatory framework that is coming. And that's going to help regulate cryptos to protect investors while unleashing innovation in America within this industry. Which is allowing institutions to get more aggressive to invest in some of the best crypto projects because they've been given this green light. Now, regulation is scary, especially for government plans to overregulate, which they tend to do, and sometimes they underregulate, like we saw with the credit crisis. I mean, who everyone is asleep by the wheel that you know, nobody even knows that how far that exposure went or what happened until six, seven, eight months into that credit crisis. No one knew AIG had exposure. There's no insuring all this shit. Nobody knew. Regulations were in place. So what's the government do? They overregulate then, right? There's got to be a medium, right? So that's what we're hoping in crypto. We're hoping there's going to be a medium where we know investors need to get protected, be protected. And without that kind of regulation, it's scary. I mean, it opens the door to massive liability for institutions who are putting other people's, right? Other people's money, money that they manage into this industry. So there's lots of questions I'm getting from you, lots of questions I'm getting out there in terms of what kind of regulation to expect, even to have media companies reaching out. That's why I'm bringing on Ken Falcon. Ken Falcon is a lawyer, managing partner of Falcon, Rapport, and Berkman. Okay, Ken has been investing in crypto since 2014. He's also seen his money stolen by hackers in the past. Uh, but if you look at his firm, very respectable. You see it covers so many areas. But now they're making a major push into crypto. So much so that Falcon, Rapport, Berkman became the first law firm to purchase land in the metaverse. How cool is that? So if you own crypto... I don't care if it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, to the shittiest altcoin. This is a must-listen interview about regulation. I promise you, we didn't make it boring. We're going to go over everything that he expects to happen, what's going to happen, but definitely give this a listen, especially if you own any crypto, which I know a lot of you do. And let's get to that interview right now. Ken, thanks so much for joining us on Wall Street Unplugged. Absolutely. Thanks for having me here, Frank. I really appreciate it. So... We met not long ago through another party, and we spoke maybe one or two times. And, and with everything going on with Biden's executive order and, and more regulation coming into the industry, people are nervous. I've um, been promoting it's a good thing. I don't know where you are in it, but let's start before we even get to that, get into details of NFTs and metaverse and, and you know how that's going to impact everyone in terms of the regulations coming down the road. Uh, I looked at, at, at your company, Falcon Rapport Berkman, right? Your practice and you're the real estate, healthcare, cannabis, wills, trust, corporate securities. I mean, really great practice covering lots of areas. What made you get into crypto? Um, so I, I've been in the crypto space since 2014. Um, I had a small mining operation at the time. Um, unfortunately, at a certain point, it was like, oh, it'd be cheaper to, to buy the crypto than to keep the mining equipment running. Um, so we took it offline but then didn't actually buy the, the crypto. If I did, maybe, who knows, maybe I, I would or wouldn't be sitting here right now. Um, but we, uh, you know, I, 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 so I've been involved in it since then. Um, I, I've been working with some, at the time, it was a couple of people who were also running mining operations, mining companies. Um, and that was how I, I, I kind of got into it. And really, you know, the practice is designed to be able to, to bring a lot of different practice areas together to help somebody and the the crypto world in general has a lot of you know interdisciplinary concerns so that's kind of how how we've now shifted into into this practice um is just due to the many needs of of people in the space it's amazing you say needs of people in the space because we heard that from jamie diamond we've heard that from lots of institutions which i think probably with the lobbying dollars probably led to biden coming out and say okay 
we got to announce something and keep this in the U.S., but there's clients everywhere that want to be in crypto. I mean, whether and it's speculative asset, of course, but just a small percentage where they're seeing the innovation that's taking place in it and clients are demanding it. And that's what I want to ask you about the Biden's executive order. I've been making a big deal about this. The crypto diehards that follow me say that it's not, you know, they want total decentralization until they get, you know, their money stolen. They have nobody to call. Right? <laughs> but uh, for me, it's... It, when you're looking at the major institutions that manage money, the biggest, they all came and said this is a watershed moment. So what are your thoughts on it? And uh, you can give it to me with the ambulance in the background because you're probably in New York in my hometown, which is awesome. <laughs> yep. So, uh, yep. yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Is it a watershed moment? Are you seeing more demand come in uh, immediately? I mean, we've seen announcements from Goldman Sachs and even from Bridgewater saying they're going to get into crypto now. You know, what are your thoughts? Is that really a game changer? Or is it something like, hey, you know what? We still need to see what's going to happen. So it's it's both, I think, right? So on the one hand, I think it's a game changer because we have the U.S. government taking cryptocurrency seriously and the existence of the, the the crypto ecosystem, right? Like acknowledging it as a thing and as a thing that they want to promote um, to a certain extent, right? Support, not promote. Um, so that that's huge because, you know, if, if I go back to 2014, 16, even 18, cryptocurrency was a punchline on Saturday Night Live. It wasn't a, you know, it wasn't worthy of being in an executive order or really being in the, in the minds of many politicians. Um, now it's just it's too big to ignore. Um, so in that sense, it's a, it's a watershed moment. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like the, the thought that a president would actually issue an executive order saying explore the idea of having a central bank, uh, you know, digital currency is like, whoa. Right. If you if you had said even even in 2020 to someone that this is coming on the horizon, I think a lot of people would have would have laughed at you. Certainly in 2014, they would have laughed at you. Um, mm -hmm. So just seeing that change and that arc has been has been huge. And I think the the issue with crypto has been always one of adoption and familiarity and that pricing has moved up and, and adoption has moved up as people became more and more familiar with it. Um, at the same time, right, the order really directs a lot of exploration. And I understand a lot of people's hesitancy because mm -hmm. the first three or four points in the executive order are like, there are a lot of really bad uses of crypto, right? A lot of really bad use cases, a lot of potential for fraud, a lot of, you know, bad actors using it like that. That's and, and like, and how do we do consumer protection and, and good regulation around this? Right. So I, I understand why people are concerned. Um, at the same time, I don't know if it's preferable to the current climate where there's a lot of uncertainty. So at least this is the government is studying it. And we're hopefully on a, a six to 12 month timeline before we have real regulations that are designed for this, um, you know, being passed or at least discussed rather than right now, which we're just cobbling together and using old law to try to make it fit into a, a situation that was just never contemplated. And where do you see the regulation come from? Is it the FTC? Is it the SEC? Uh, I mean, they said like all orga organizations are open to it. I just feel like when it comes to the government, I mean, and, and it's it's common to just you know talk negatively right about about the government about whatever. I'm not saying that, sure. but they they don't know about cryptocurrencies, right? They know very little. It's a huge learning curve. A lot of these guys are lawyers. They don't even know the markets too much. So, uh, you know, some of them, not all of them, not guys like you who invested in Bitcoin. So, do you fear? that we may get that overregulation or not enough regulation. For example, pre-credit crisis, we saw that wasn't enough regulation. We had, I mean, they had no idea what the banks were doing, right? Just leveraging of leveraging right. subprime loans. And then afterwards, now we have overregulation where you can have $5 million in a bank buying a $2 million house. And if you don't make a certain amount of income, they're like, they, it's just a red, nope, sorry, we're not going to lend it to you. It's, it's so much tighter right. now. So you know, what do you see? And I know it's hard to predict with the government just announcing that they're going to regulate the industry and get organizations involved. But you know, what are you seeing here? You, you free, over regulation, under regulation? Because what worries me the most is that you know we're talking about groups that really don't understand the crypto market, and it's a huge learning curve. It's not something to e it's that easy to learn. Yeah, um, I, I think that we're going to see a, a combination of things. I, I think we'll, we'll start with right now. The regulatory environment is untenable. Right, right now, every a federal agency wants to figure out some way to, to dip their hand into the regulatory pot. The SEC wants to say everything's a security, right? The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau wants to say you're ignoring consumer protection laws. Treasury wants to say you're not paying your taxes, right? Everybody, or you're not paying them correctly. Everyone wants to say something different and they all want to bring it under their regulatory umbrella. Um, that's a problem because there's just, there's no clear direction right now, right? 
because most of it is just they're, they're shaking their fingers at certain either big players or bad actors and saying you violated SEC rule X. So we're going to be pursuing you for that, um, you know, or, or you didn't pay your taxes correctly. So we're going to be pursuing you for that. But they're not telling you this is the way that you avoid doing things incorrectly. So that that is super difficult for anyone who wants to be a legitimate player in the space right now. Um, at the same time, you know, the way that laws get made, the reality is they paint with a broader brush. So they can't be t- narrowly tailored. And there will be those outlier situations like the five million dollar, you know, liquid net worth guy who's got, you know, only a little bit of an income and can't buy a two million dollar house. Mm-hmm. Right. Th- th- those cases are going to exist almost no matter what is done. But I'm hopeful that what is done will be done in a thoughtful way um, in a way that actually promotes development. And to do that, they have to design a a system that regular business players are capable of complying with. And that would be an exciting thing and a a huge, you know, starting point from here. Tremendous departure from the foundations of cryptocurrency and the whole idea of decentralized finance and, 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 you know, uh, you know, trustless transactions and smart contracts, huge departure from that. Um, but at the same time, in terms of practical operation in the real world, it's I'm hopeful that there will be some good that comes out of it. I can't predict the future, but I'm hopeful. Yeah, it, it is a huge departure. But at the end of the day, you need to know your money is safe, like at a brokerage firm, right? I mean, th- these are simple things. You, you need to have insurance, right? FDIC or, or whatever it is. And, and you know, it is scary, and I see that part where you know it, the tendency is to overregulate. But you, and plus, you don't know too much about the industry. It's kind of tough. But one of the, one of the things that you said that I think is the biggest issue is: are these securities or not? And if a lot of these things are deemed security, you can take Bitcoin, Ethereum out of there, maybe a couple of others, Litecoin. But the other five, six, seven thousand, you know, maybe over ten thousand coins now. But a lot of these things are securities. I mean, we got to face the facts, right? They are securities, uh, at least. You know, based on the law and what you're looking at, I don't know if you'll agree or not, but I think it's more of a security than not. And again, I'm not a lawyer. You could instruct me that. But is there a chance that they come out and say that these are securities? Because if they do, the market is definitely not ready for this. I mean, Coinbase, almost everything on there has to, is, is, I mean, they're going to have to file, right? They're going to have to report. And a lot well, of these guys raise being, money. Yeah. They're being pursued even right now. I, I, I had seen something recently that Coinbase is being pursued for one of the coins they had listed. I think it's Shiba Inu coin or something that there's a claim that that's a security. Um, so they're being pursued for it. It's going to happen, right? The the problem is that the, you know, the Howey test was designed, I, I don't even know when, but decades ago, right? Before <laughs> yeah. cryptocurrency was even a glint mm-hmm. in uh, Satoshi's eye. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, but it's being, you know, it's it's square peg round hole kind of stuff where they're like, well, it shares a lot of characteristics of securities. It might be a security under the Howey test. Is it a security in the classic sense? You know, it's, it's, an, it's it, the analysis is coin by coin, token by token. You know, most of the time, yes, you're going to fall under the, the Howey test. For the vast majority of clients, what we're doing for them is we are um, helping them work within the, the framework of assume this is a security. How do we still achieve our business purpose knowing that it's probably a security? Right. And that's that's kind of the framework a lot of people are working with. Right? Yeah, because that's uh, something that is I, I don't know. I don't know how that how it's going to, you know, because we have our own security token and, you know, we checked off all the boxes have a cap table, raise money. It's real equity. But when I see a lot of these and even when I talk to them and, and, and you yeah, know, they're like, well, you know, we own this and this and this. So our tokens worth that. I'm like, that has nothing to do with your, t- your token is a utility function. Right. So you could own 20 million dollars worth of real estate in the metaverse, but it's really worth it's worthless to anyone who wants to buy a token because it's not the same thing, right? Unless that token has a utility feature where that's, you know, how you're buying that real estate, right? So it, it's just that disconnection, I think, that I don't know if people need to understand the regulation curves, but it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how hard they come at this. And, you know, from a regulatory standpoint, fine. We, we have a lot of things covered. Uh, you said you first started uh, in, in crypto 2014. Was it just Ethereum? Was it Bitcoin? I'm really curious. Um, it was Bitcoin. And then at a certain point, it was it was more efficient to mine Dogecoin and convert it to Bitcoin uh, than it was to mine Bitcoin directly. So for, for a long time, I was and it's funny because at the time, Dogecoin was worth like it was literally nothing. No one knew what it was. It was a joke on the Internet. Mm-hmm. And I, I have transaction records. Unfortunately, a lot of mine was stolen by an exchange, uh, by a, mm-hmm. a bad exchange, the crypto exchange. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, 
so you know at the at the end of the day i long story short my friends were, were all joking about this as it was as it was taking its ride up and it, it eclipsed a penny which i was like holy crap it's worth a penny that's unbelievable mm-hmm. right and it made it all the way to about 70 cents now it's down i think something like 15 cents or whatever which yeah. is still astronomically higher than than what it was it was worth um, but I did end up pull, pulling out and selling some, uh, some, some small amount of it, but yeah, I was, it was, so it was Dogecoin for the purpose of converting, but it was so, you know, kind of worthless that, you know, a, a lot of it just kind of sat. So this is interesting. So, you, you know, you have your license, you're a lawyer, and then this gets stolen from you. What did you, I think it's important, is relevant to the conversation, but what were you able to do? Absolutely nothing, right? Once it was stolen, I mean, were you well, no, they had, they, there, was a, there, there was a class action lawsuit that people can participate in to, to get money back and, and whatever else. Um, I, I honestly did not, I didn't diligently pursue it because I just didn't have a lot sitting on the exchange. At mm-hmm. the time of my loss, it wasn't really worth that much. Um, now, like in retrospect, I'm like a half a million Dogecoin, right? Translates, <laughs> to, uh, it's a couple hundred thousand dollars now or a hundred thousand dollars. Now that's real yeah. money, right? I, I would have, yep. I would have definitely gone after it had, had I only known, but I mean, that's, you know, I, I could say that about a lot of investments. It's like my, my ultimate gambler's fallacy is like when I bought a couple of for a thousand dollars, I should have bought, you know, I should have bought a hundred of them, but yeah, you know. No, I know. We all say we all have those stories. We bought Amazon. I mean, if if you did hold on to, especially those tokens uh, and coins, uh, you'd probably own the building that you're broadcasting from right now. So, <laughs> but let's get into the metaverse because I I believe you said you bought property in in the metaverse, and I also saw when I was doing the research as a law firm. And I don't. First of all, where did you buy? Did you buy the Central Land? Is that where you bought it? Central Land. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The Central Land. So we once... bought. Mm-hmm. Okay. No. So yeah. So we bought we bought this parcel in the Central Land. Um, and we are, as far as we know, we are the first blockchain based law firm in the metaverse, right? Awesome. Um, meaning it's, or, so it is a, so we, we, we bought the parcel, we, we, uh, hired developers, they built us an office building there. Um, we had a launch party there. Uh, a bunch of people came with their avatars. They all wanted, uh, FRB NFTs, uh, which we gave out to the, the attendees kind of, uh, just a commemorative, uh, NFT. Um, and it's been it's been a really interesting ride even before then, but especially since then. Um, there's just been a, a huge uptick in activity and being able to participate in the in the community, um, being active participants in the community, which we are, has been has been really um, helpful to us. So talk about because I saw when when I was reading and again I do a lot of research on everyone for an interview that. It sure. seems like your specialty is in real estate, right? Especially with, with law and practice and stuff like that. And you're actually buying real estate. I think that's one thing people can identify with when it comes into the metaverse. There's so many things going around, selling NFTs, you know, playing game functions, different things what, that you could do in these worlds. But the real estate aspect is something people can identify with is how do you compare buying real estate in the metaverse, which this is going to sound funny to some people, but yet buying real estate someplace else, anyplace else in the U.S., because you are buying property, it seems like it matters where you purchase it, where it is, where the, you know that value could grow tremendously as more people come online. But talk about that process and, and how is it different and how is it not so different from just buying regular real estate besides the fact one's in a digital world and one's obviously you know hard asset. Sure. So there are... You know, there, there are a lot of, of significant differences. Um, you know, the, the biggest ones being a lot of the concerns you have around real estate just aren't there for digital real estate. Right. Um, I, I sort of have title concerns, but not really, because everything is uh, on, a, on a distributed ledger. So I know who owned my parcel before I owned it. Or I don't I don't know who that person is, but I know what wallet address controlled the, the parcel and I can trace it from its genesis through through right now. Um, you know, I, I have no liability or risk of destruction type concerns. You know, so there's 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 a lot that's that's different as far as that goes. The major difference is right. The the thing about real estate that makes it an attractive asset class to a lot of people, at least, is the old maxim of they, they ain't making any more of it, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a limited supply. There's only so much within this really desirable area, right? If I want to buy property on the island of Manhattan, that's really expensive to do because there's only so much property on the island of Manhattan. Um, if I want to buy property in the sandbox, right, right now it's, yeah, okay. It's, it's limited, um, to, to the amount that's been released. I do, I do not pretend to be a super technical person. So, but it, it strikes me as the kind of thing where if you can create the sandbox and let's say that accounts for, you know, a hundred thousand parcels, why couldn't they just add another million parcels? 
Mm-hmm. I, I don't I don't think I don't think that there's anything preventing them from doing it other than the technological side of, of coding the program to do it. Yeah. Um, and maybe they would have to, right? Maybe it would be sandbox two, it would be a brand new um, you know, a brand new space. But this is this is the next frontier of um of, of digital real estate ownership is the fact that there will be multiple platforms competing to be the island of Manhattan in the digital real estate world, right? Is it going to be Decentraland? Um, is it going to be the sandbox? You know, the, the it looks like the board apes are trying to do their own land sale and they've been very successful in the NFT space. Is that going to be the metaverse that people want to be in? Will will Meta or some other company be able to to create some kind of technology that fuses all of these and brings them together so that you'll be able to interact across multiple metaverses. I mean, the, the technology is just evolving so rapidly and I, I know so little about the, you know, the computer coding side of things that it's hard to speak about, but yeah. So from the metaverse, what you said, even in your metaverse and NFTs, you know, NFTs is the buzzword. Uh, NFTs are down a lot and we've seen lots of scams with NFTs, but there's no doubt that this technology is for real, at least in my opinion. This is, you know, tra- you have ownership of your stuff in a digital world. Uh, where do you see regulation coming where you do have the blockchain, right? So, you know, uh, what, so, you know which helps tremendously, uh, but there still probably needs to be some regulation considering you know, the, the tens of millions of dollars that have been stolen, just I think it was in January, it was something like an amount of $20, $30 million in NFTs or whatever it is. But people are just launching these things at campaigns and people think they could just get at them because it's exciting. Next thing you know, the people disappear, take all your money. You know, where does this come in terms of, I mean, this is an industry that has to be regulated. Like every industry, when it first starts, you're going to have your bad actors. But this is something that I think, I don't know if you agree or not, I certainly do. The more I learn about this, the, the potential is incredible, but there's still a lot of scams going on. How does how do we stop this from a regulatory standpoint? Yeah, it, it's a humongous challenge um, and, and one that I honestly don't know whether the government is well suited to solve right now, because I, I do think that there's a lot of misunderstanding about what's going on um, and a lot of difficult, but there's also a lot of difficulty just given what the um, what the environment is. Right. So anyone can create an NFT project and those people are by design anonymous or pseudonymous. Right. They're hidden behind Twitter handles and wallet addresses. And that's all you know about these people, really. Right. They might claim that they're someone else. They might even be someone else. Right. And, and, they, and they may be saying that they are who they are on, on a website. But, you know, people have have known who each other are and scammed one another out of money, you know, since since the dawn of time, presumptively. So. There are a lot of scams going on. My partner Moish likes to say everything in crypto is a scam until proven otherwise, and I think that's a healthy, um, you know, a- a attitude of skepticism to take. Um, and, and there is always the risk of a rug pu- a pull on any real and any NFT project in the nature of the, um, especially these community-based PFP, the profile picture um, projects w- like the Board Apes, right? Mm-hmm. People say, okay, I'm making. 10,000 NFTs, I'm building this community, and here I am running this community right now um, and, and being really enthusiastic about it and whatever else, and you know, you should mint one, and then people mint them, and you hope that people take that, that mint money and they create a real company out of it. And we're, we're helping a lot of people do that. They, you know, they wake up and suddenly they have a couple of million dollars and they're like, oh, wow, I, re- I have to like hire staff and actually execute now. And it's a real, it's a real life company that just exists because of the uh, the NFT world, but there are a lot of people who wake up and say, "I have three million dollars in my bank account right now, or in my in my crypto wallet right now. I never have to work again, <laughs> right? That's more money than I've ever even thought about in my life." Yeah. Um, and and they and they just they they run with it. Um, so you're you're fighting against human nature, and you're fighting against um, you know some some really powerful forces uh, when you're when you're trying to regulate it. So, you know, how, how do you do that effectively? It's, it's a super complicated question that I honestly think is probably beyond the knowledge level of our current regulators, unless they're going to look for real industry input as they develop this. But the industry is also relatively immature. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I have concerns about what kind of regulation comes down. I'm hopeful it'll be better than what we have right now. I also am acknowledging that whatever regulation comes out is is version 1.0. Yes. And there has to be there's going to have to be a, a 2.0 and the one thing that that Congress and regulators are really good at is moving at the speed of a snail. Um 
and we're and we're in a space that moves at the speed of lightning, and it's just it's two different universes. Absolutely. And I interviewed Hester Pierce, too, from the SEC. I said earlier that a lot of them, do, there are people who do know crypto, right? Within Congress, within, you know, some of these organizations, and she's from the SEC, and, and you know, she's pro-crypto, right? So uh, she made it clear that, you know, this is her opinion, not the SEC opinion when, when I interviewed her. But, you know, there are people there that, that could definitely help, but there is a big learning curve. Uh, I guess... Let me continue here with asking you this question. Someone's been here since 2014 makes you like, a you know, you've been in this for light years, right? I mean, it's a long time ago, 2014. Now you, you come to, to, you know, seeing where crypto has come. Now you have your law practice, which is very large. It's a lot of different things and you're getting into crypto. Where do you see crypto over the next 10, 15, 20 years? And not even talking from a lawyer perspective, someone who's been investing in this stuff for a long time. Sure. Um, well, let's say uh, I'll start with uh, everyone do your own research. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I personally am very bullish on the space. I think that we're going to see pricing continue to move up. You know, historically, I, I've now been through so many cycles of Bitcoin is amazing. Crypto is going to make us all billionaires. Everything is great. And then the interest falls off. The price crashes, comes down 70 percent. And everyone's like, it's dead. It's never coming back. It's gone. And then it, but then it does it again. And again, and the trajectory is always upwards. So I see, and I see that continuing. And I think that's driven by market forces related to participation. You know, Bitcoin itself is an artificially scarce resource. And the more people want it, the higher the price will go, presuming there are other alternatives that meet the same need. Um, and, and, I, and given that, and given the mining difficulty and, and the, the way the algorithm is coded, I see my, my personal opinion is that we're going to see Bitcoin and Ethereum pricing um, go up. A lot of proof of work tokens are, are going to go up as long as they have real life use cases um, or, or a significant enough following. Um, I think we're going to see some good regulation that needs to happen, especially around exchanges. Maybe I'm just taking this personally because I got my own money stolen. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, people are, you know, people in the, in the, in this world are like, you know, well, now some kid in his mom's basement can't just make a website and say he's a cryptocurrency exchange. The whole idea was to be decentralized so anyone can do this. And my answer to you on that is who wants that 16 year old kid in their mother's basement to be running their, you know, to be holding on to and have custody of millions of dollars in assets? Yeah. Even if they're not a bad actor, how careful are they? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and a lot of concern. So I, I'm, I'm happy to see exchanges regulated to a significant extent. Um, and, and I think that's a necessary piece of, of just cutting off the bad actors at the knees, um, at least in the U.S., right? But nothing's going to stop a bunch of offshore people from just starting exchanges and running away with money. Exactly. It's going to keep happening. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. But that, and that will entrench the, the big players, which is why, you know, when I, when I look at something like Coinbase, I'm like this, like they, Coinbase, Gemini, you know, Kraken, um, maybe Binance less so to a certain extent, um, you know, they're going to be here to stay. Because people actually trust them. Because Coinbase could have, you know, I had two choices as, as to where I was going to keep my, my Bitcoins that I did not keep in cold storage. It was Coinbase or it was Mt. Gox, MTGOX, mm -hmm. which was like the original, you know, crypto exchange scam. <laughs> and I, I, I happened to have gotten lucky and chosen to keep it at Coinbase. Mm -hmm. Thank God. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but. It could have just as easily gone the other way. And that, that's a big risk factor that needs to be taken out because people aren't tech savvy enough yet. Uh, no, like, no one wants to run their own servers. Like cold storage is great, but you, you lose the ability to transact. Um, so it's important to have an intermediary. And, and more than that, right, if, if, I, if I screw up a transaction on my wallet, I could, I could burn or lose access to, to all or a substantial part of my crypto. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love someone to find a workaround to where that won't happen. You know, one, one, yeah. one digit in a, in a key, just poof, it's all gone. You know, that, like, that's a, yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm with you. Is even when you're buying a stock, say on E-Trade or whatever, Schwab, whatever online platform you use, you don't know about custody. You don't know about legends being removed. If you're in private placements, you don't know, you know, shares, the shares being transferred. Like you just buy the stock and that's all people want to do and be safe with everything else on the outside. And I think that's what people need to understand that everything behind the scenes needs to be really tied together and safe. And that's going to bring in, that's, that's when you scale right now. Everyone can get into this and feel comfortable and yeah, just hoping like you are that it's not overregulated. So, 
Uh, last thing here. Uh, so you said F4B Law, uh, you know, which stands for Falcon, Rappaport, and, and Berkman, which is your law firm. Uh, why don't you talk about it a little bit if people want to learn a little bit more? Maybe they have their own crypto place and they're looking for lawyers, which a lot of people are these days. Uh, why don't you talk about it? And I can bring that up right here for our YouTube followers. Sure. Yeah. So, so we are basically we're, we're designed to be an interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary law firm, right? We um, we have expertise in a lot of different areas. The ones that primarily come into play with crypto, it's tax, it's corporate and securities, intellectual property, um, and, and we can really handle everything from you know you, you have an NFT project or or an interesting idea that involves crypto, right? Getting the company started up, getting it funded. Um, we have connections to people in the space who we know to be, um, you know, good actors and, and legitimate people and capable people. Um, you know, we, we have it so we can make those connections for you. Um, we'll help you stay compliant with the law and, and we'll bring together a, a huge team um, to, to really address all the aspects of your project and not look at it from, from one lens in a bubble and potentially overlook something really significant. You know, examples would be, um, you know, setting something up that that's proper in ter- from a securities perspective, but has really bad tax consequences for someone, um, or or setting something up with a really solid intellectual property background and proper licensing in place, but not having the securities and corporate background to be able to to make sure that the structure itself is uh, is sound and stands up to regulatory and legal scrutiny. Um, so, really, a- anyone in this space, if you want to talk to us, um, we're here. We, we're here to serve as a resource. Allied professionals, right? Accountants, other attorneys, financial advisors. If you have questions about this space, we want to be a resource to you. Um, happy to share, you know, knowledge and experience with with anyone who's interested. And it's frblaw.com. If anyone wants to reach out to you, I don't know if it's emails right. They could probably find everything right in the site, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, they can email kfalcon at frblaw.com or just info at frblaw.com. Um, where you know, we're we're good with that stuff. Okay, last question here, which I know you're going to say no, but I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> is there anything that – I'll even go out to a sector within this, if it's DeFi, if it's security tokens, if it's you know things that we talked about, metaverse and NFTs, or is there any individual or tokens or anything that, that you know have your interest? And I know you know in your profession it might be tough to, to mention, but maybe you can mention personally or things that, that excite you. And feel free to say no. I'm trying here. <laughs> no, no. But listen, there, there are, there, there are things that excite me. I'll say this, right? So I have gotten into my fair share of bad altcoins. Okay, there's a, there's a not so nice name for those coins, uh, and I've gotten into them before. And what I have realized is that on a long term trajectory, right, the best thing I ever could have done would have been to stick in Ethereum and Bitcoin and just mm-hmm. hold tight and, and go nowhere. Um, and, and that's my current personal strategy as far as individual cryptos go. Um, there are some really interesting NFT projects going on. I think the, the board apes, I mean, it's like it's untouchable from a price point perspective right now for people to get into. Right. But looking for a community based NFT program, I think, is, is really interesting. Um, I think that the, the and as far as the individual cryptocurrencies, um, the ones that have smart contract capability and something else going for them are the ones that are likely to, to survive and to thrive um, on, a, on a going forward basis. I, uh, specific ones, um, my, my partner is, is interested in, in Avalanche. I'm interested in Avalanche. I think it has potential. I think any of the cryptos that underlie an exchange, um, the same way that Binance Smart Chain and, and Binance Coin, Right. It went from being nothing to suddenly being worth hundreds of dollars per coin. I don't even know what the current price is. Um, but similarly, right, if 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 Coinbase comes out with their own internal coin other than USDC, I, I would bet that that's going to be a good a good bet. That's my my own personal thesis. Again, do your own research, not investment <laughs> advice. Yada, yada, yada. I got a lot. Um, of that. I was surprised. I was surprised. You just, yeah. So I'm going to have the headline. You know, Ken Falcon says to, to buy Avalanche going up 5,000%. I'll have a headline for you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate I think sure you guys are going to do it. Their mouths are watering right now. They're just, they're just <laughs> waiting for that. And of course, I'm not going to do that. But yeah, I appreciate it because, you know, all of us, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I've been involved in crypto in a while too. And people ask me my favorite ideas and sometimes I share them on, on you know, the personal basis. But Listen, Ken, you gave us a lot. I know people that they'll see, oh, a lawyer's coming on and it might be boring. I mean, we, we, I think we made this as entertaining as possible just for the fact that this is significant, right? I mean, you're going to have more institutions coming in. We need more regulation. How much is going to be? And someone that actually owns real estate in the metaverse within your firm and, 
you know, someone who's been in this industry for such a long time, I, I think uh, you're a big help to a lot of my subscribers and a lot of uh, my file who are really, really into crypto thanks to us. But uh, I really appreciate you coming on, man. Absolutely. Thanks very much for having me, Frank. I really appreciate it. Hey, guys. Great stuff from Ken there. I know we covered a lot. NFTs, metaverse, how investors need to know that money's protected. And I think we can all agree with that. It's just the overregulation is scary. And we saw that. We saw it during the credit crisis. We saw it where you know no one knew the exposure to, to AIG had until seven, eight months into it. Or how much exposure with the synthetic of synthetic of synthetic you know, sub, leveraging of subprime mortgages. And they were asleep at the wheel, which is under regulation. And what happened afterwards, you see that overregulation. So you know, to have something in the middle is very important for those institutions to come in. I thought Ken did a great job explaining that while also sharing some really cool stories. Hey, I was hacked. <laughs> Which, again, uh, I've lost Bitcoin, too, back in the day. Again, a lot of these things are, are, are much more protected now, uh, especially the ones that, you know, Coinbase. And if you buy it on Robinhood and things like that, especially, you know, those are brokerage companies, right? They have those little licenses in place. My money's protected. Um, and surprise, you also share one of the cryptos that he likes, which is really, really cool. So great stuff. I know you guys probably have lots of questions, any comments, whatever, frankcurserresearch.com. I'm here for you. Uh, but I always say this, and I mean it. This podcast is about you, not about me. I love the interview. I think it's necessary for everyone who's involved in crypto of what's coming down the pipeline because I could say positive things about Biden's executive plan and how it's going to lead to more institutional money. But we want to make sure that regulation is a place where it's not overregulated. It's not crazy. So let me know what you thought of that interview at Frank at CurseyResearch.com. That's Frank at CurseyResearch.com. So you have two days left. We load our price crypto intelligence newsletter by 50%. And over the next few days, if you sign up, you're going to get one extra year for free. So as you know, we're huge believers in this industry. To the fact where I structured my entire company behind launching one of the first ever security tokens where investors can own an actual equity stake, not a utility token. You're going to own an equity stake in Curse Your Research. You could do that by owning our token, which trades on T0 platform under the symbol CURZ, Curse. And by doing this early on, it's given us access to so many companies looking to launch their own security tokens, tokens that you're going to get a look at first. And that's coming. And that's what I'm really, really excited about. Also, Utility tokens where we're going to be getting into pre-sales based on our contacts, which, by the way, it is you know, the pre-sales are similar to investing in a private placement where you could buy the stock at a discount, except in crypto, you don't have to be an accredited investor to invest in most of these pre-sales when you're getting in early. So this is the access crypto intelligence offers you. It's because we've been in this industry for a while, we cover it for a while, we have great contacts, institutional contacts. Uh, great names. You're going to see more and more interviews going forward uh, of some of the great names in this industry explaining this, the pros, the cons, everything. Okay, We want to be 100% transparent. There's a lot of risk in this industry. We just saw a hack in this industry. We're going to see more hacks in this industry. That's why we need regulation, come, at least some kind of regulatory framework where investors feel protected and institutions, like I said, could check off that box now that you have Biden saying, okay, here it comes. We're going to push all into this industry now. Okay, that gives a green light. For instance, the reason why a lot of that news came out in the past few weeks, okay, when you give that green light and saying, okay, we know there's going to be some kind of regulatory framework. We know we can, we know the U.S. isn't going to say no and shut it down. Okay, because that would be damaging and really crazy for any institution to say, hey, let's start this project. Let's invest in this when we really don't know what's going on. Now we have an idea that, hey, we're going all in. We want to unleash innovation. That's a very, very big step. It's the reason why you've seen crypto surge. Over the past few weeks after that, now you've seen a lot of more money coming to this industry. There's $250 trillion in assets under management. Of course, not all of it's going to come into crypto, not 50%, not 20%, and maybe not 10%. But if 1% or 2% comes in, which the clients of these firms want, they want to get into these names, they're requesting to get into these names, you're talking trillions. Trillions and trillions of dollars flowing into an industry that's what? Just touch $2 trillion. So it's a game changer. So you're seeing an industry that makes sense in this environment. People like Bitcoin, countries like Bitcoin. You understand what's going on with the Fed and how they're printing money. All these countries printing money. You saw a good test case with China and a ruble. How if you had your money just sitting there, it's worth 50% less. Yet if you put it in Bitcoin, it would be a lot higher. Or if you put it someplace else. So when you look at other currencies, I know you live in the US and you're like, ah, maybe you don't know too much about currencies and you should. That's fine. But when you're looking around the world... When you see those declines in these currencies, which we saw even in Canada, which declined tremendously since 2012, 30%, 35%, right? And you lose that that purchasing power, that that money. Now you're looking at Bitcoin making being an option for countries around the world. For the US to say we might start our own central banking crypto and currency, that, that's incredible. 
So this industry is still in its infancy. You're going to see a whole nother leg coming up with all this innovation. We have one of the best newsletters in this industry. You're not going to see that discount often, especially not the free year where we sometimes we discount the price by 20%, 30%. We discount by 50%. And we also give it away a year for free. Okay, we don't usually do that with the offers. We're doing that because right now is a very, very good time to get in. And we want you to be in for two years. I want you to be in for two years as these trends develop. It's going to be volatile. Yes, it's going to be volatile. But long term... This is where I'm putting my money personally. This is the industry I believe in. Of course, I believe in lots of stocks and, and, and you know commodities right now and banks, and I covered that in the last podcast. But crypto is a place I'm putting most of my speculative money. I've done very, very well in this industry. I plan to do very well going forward just with the new ideas and the access we have. It's a lot, a lot of fun. So if you're interested in taking us up on that offer, just go to cursedresearch.com. If not, no worries. Again, you got two days to get that special offer before we remove it from our site. So guys, that's it for me. Questions, comments. Again, I'm here for you, frankcursedresearch.com. Have a wonderful Wonderful weekend for those who don't get our Frankly Speaking podcast, which is coming out tomorrow, uh, which doesn't come on iTunes. It just goes to paid people who paid any subscription, any product, no matter how cheap it is or expensive it is, you automatically get Frankly Speaking emailed to you. That's a special podcast where I'm answering your questions, Q&A, which is really cool. Uh, but I'll see you guys tomorrow for Frankly Speaking. Everyone else, I'll catch you on the other side next weekend. Take care.